Hey, what's up? This is Kevin from Kevin's Barbecue Joints, and in this episode, I get a chance to talk to Jeremy Yoder from Mad Scientist Barbecue. He's not connected to Yoder Smokers at all, and he mentions that early on. Mad Scientist Barbecue has a ton of videos. It's an incredibly popular YouTube channel. I'll put a link in the show notes to that. Uh, I want to talk to him specifically about that, but also he has a fat stack smoker and fat stack smokers out of uh, Sun Valley here in California. They're making, they made smokers for... Uh, for Moose Craft Barbecue, for uh, Trudy's Underground Barbecue, for Burt. They recently, I saw that they had done one for a, a Flat Point, which is a, a new pop up, a relatively new pop up. Uh, so they're doing a lot of stuff. And so I wanted to kind of talk to him about that connection and learn about his journey and where he came from and why uh, why it's called My Mad Scientist Barbecue. And of course, because of the name, he, he looks at things from a science background. So that's uh, it's really interesting to see uh, his process and understand how he puts together his videos and what he's thinking about. Uh, he also, uh, he grew up Amish, and so we talk about that. And, uh, I'm incredibly intrigued by that. So uh, I hope you guys enjoy that little portion of this and, and learn more about uh, what it is to grow up Amish, how he was a teacher, and, and that kind of makes sense as to how he does his videos. Uh, they're very informative, and uh, he, he's an amazing teacher and it shows in his videos and then we talk about what the, uh, the future of his channel is and the things that he's gonna be doing he's gonna be doing some videos with Eric over at fat stack smoker about uh, the different components and building the smokers and then he's purchased a bunch of science equipment to do to run tests on smoking brisk and on pork ribs beef ribs different things so so I look forward to and I'm sure you do too a lot of really cool videos coming out from him this was filmed in February right before his trip to Austin so look forward to a number of uh, videos too of his uh, his different barbecue joint visits and this episode is sponsored by the smoke sheet which is a barbecue newsletter that comes out every Wednesday it's available at bbqnewsletter.com super easy to sign up to uh, it, it's, it's a newsletter, and I've talked about in previous episodes how they talk about barbecue joint openings and closings and news within the barbecue world, but also they do write articles themselves, and, and they being Ryan Cooper, who is barbecue tourist, and Sean Ludwig, who is NYC Barbecue. They write articles about the barbecue world and about things that are happening, events that they've gone to. So it's, it's, it's news, it's articles there's information on podcasts and new youtube stuff that's gone up all within the barbecue world there's a barbecue recipe of the week there's a ton of stuff and i i scroll through it and i think i thought i knew this so i do learn something every week and you will actually use this it's not something that it's going to go into your inbox and you'll just delete it it's it's worth opening and reading once again it's available at bbqnewsletter.com that's bbqnewsletter.com the smoke sheet is barbecue news worth consuming. And if you're digging these, please subscribe. I'm adding a lot of content every day into the podcast, into the YouTube channel. Uh, I try to uh, do at least one of these per week, as well as barbecue joint visits and uh, butcher shop visits and everything meat related. I also have a website at Kevin's BBQ joints.com where I have links to all my podcasts, YouTube visits, all that stuff, as well as uh, Abe Delgado from the I Crush Barbecue Show and myself put together a weekly list of the new barbecue pop ups and uh, underground barbecue spots in Los Angeles. And that way you could plan ahead and uh, visit some of these because that's a lot of these will be a restaurant someday. And, and a lot of these places are putting out amazing barbecue, so you don't want to miss out. And thank you guys again so much for listening. I'm trying to put out uh, as much interesting content to me and to hopefully to you guys as I can. Shoot me a message. Let me know what you're thinking. Let me know if there's anybody you want me to, to reach out to and talk to. Uh, just want to keep growing this. Good evening. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm yeah. good. Um, yeah. Right now, just getting uh, ready for a trip to Austin, actually. So I'm going to go to a bunch of the top spots there. I'm really excited about that. Cool. Going to go to Snows, which is, I guess, number one in Texas, according mm -hmm. to Texas Monthly. Going to go to, um, I guess it's Micklewaite, not mm -hmm. Micklethwaite. Micklewaite. Yeah. Are you going to his new spot? Uh, I think we're going to go to the original location it's just down the street from Franklin. Cool, yeah. Um, unless they recommend that we go to the, the new location. Um, we're also going to go to uh, La Barbecue in Austin. Nice. Um, Louis Mueller Barbecue in Taylor, Texas. Yep. And then if we can squeeze it in, we're going to try to get to uh, Kreutz Market. I believe that's in Lockhart as yeah, well. Yeah, definitely. Wow. Yeah. That, is this cool just like a research trip or a – um, I'm going to be making YouTube videos and, um, I want to basically, I want to get inside their heads a little bit, um, just to understand because kind of where I'm coming from. So I live in Los Angeles now. Right. And 
there is Thai food, there's Chinese food, there's tons of Mexican food, Guatemalan food, there's uh, El Salvadorian food, there's every kind of food you can imagine. But one thing that that is missing is there's just this massive dearth of good barbecue in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And there's millions of people here. And smoke and fire and salt are things that people all like the taste of. Oh, yeah, yeah. And so I think it's just something that they need to be introduced to. And I want to know why it's... It's so culturally relevant in a place like Texas, especially Central Texas, the Austin area, whereas in Los Angeles, it just doesn't really exist. Are you going to get a chance to interview some of these people? Uh, yeah, I think so. So I think I'll be sitting down with, uh, I believe it's Carrie Brexley, the owner of Snow's yeah. Barbecue, and then Tootsie. This is the greatest name for a pit master and ever. She is awesome. She's an amazing <laughs> woman. Yeah, she's great. Yeah. Yeah, and then the owners of uh, um, Law Barbecue, and then hopefully we can get something worked out at, at some of the other places, but those are the only ones that we're pretty sure about at this point. Oh, nice. Excellent. And this is all for your YouTube channel, which we'll jump to, which is Mad Scientist Barbecue, but I wanted to right. get back. I wanted to kind of get your background. Did you grow up in Los Angeles? No, I didn't. So my last name is, is Yoder. No affiliation to Yoder Smokers at all. Um but yeah, it's a, an Amish last name. I actually grew up Amish until I was in elementary school. Okay. And um, yeah, so I did that. Uh, Can you go into that a little bit at all? Like, what was that like? Was that was it? Did you feel secluded? Not really. So a lot of people have the idea that if you're Amish, you grew up in some kind of secluded commune type of thing. Um, if you're familiar with Hutterites, that's kind of how they do. They they live on communes. Mm -hmm. Whereas Amish people, they'll live in areas where there are non-Amish people. They yeah. just live close enough to one another that they can ride their horses and buggies to church on Sunday mm -hmm. so that they have um, kind of a, a relatively small area in which the whole community lives, makes sense. even though they don't all live together. And so the reason they kind of have to do it that way is um, in Europe, uh, I guess the ancestors of the Amish were persecuted and they were drowned for being, uh, I guess, part of a theological sect called Anabaptists. Mm -hmm. So they would never have a church building. That's why I've never seen an Amish church building. They always have church in different people's houses. Okay. And so that's why they live close enough together. But my next door neighbors weren't Amish. Um, uh, the people at the end of my street were Amish. But um, if there are enough Amish people in an area, they have an Amish school. So you get on your bike in the morning after you probably milked the cows and you know fed the pigs and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. You ride your bike to school. You stay at school uh, until about two in the afternoon. You go back home. You do all those chores all over again. And then you had the evening to relax. Where I lived, there weren't quite enough Amish people in that area to have their own Amish school. So what they have is basically you send your Amish kids to the regular public school. So I rode a school bus just like everybody else. But there were a few other Amish kids in my grade. But the majority of the interactions I had were with non-Amish people. And the way that Amish people refer to people who aren't Amish yeah. is English. So if you're black or white or anything – you're, you're English as long as you're not Amish. Did the rest of your family move out of the Amish community? Is that, it's just, I'm sorry to go into this, but it's so, I'm so curious because you don't get, I don't, I don't think I've ever spoken to someone that's Amish. Sure. Yeah. Um, so like my grandparents and I have cousins and aunts and uncles who are Amish. Um, and then when we left the Amish, we, um, we didn't, we didn't even move. It's just, we stopped going to Amish church. We bought okay. a, a van and, and um, I remember I handed a note to my teacher saying I was no longer going to be Amish because otherwise you gonna wonder why I would stop wearing these Amish clothes. Um, and uh, I was young enough to where I didn't really understand anything about the decision making, uh, you know, that my, my parents put into, you know, that kind of transition. Um, I think from what I've gathered over the years, it was basically my mom thought that all the rules that they had were arbitrary and my dad was tired of getting caught breaking the rules. So they both decided that they were going to leave. Interesting. And then you, and so where was it? What, what city was that in? That was actually um, in southern Michigan, okay. a town called Colon. Colon. Colon, Michigan. Colon, Michigan. And then did yeah. you end up moving? Did they move directly to California or did you just move west a little bit? No. So pretty much immediately after that, my parents got a divorce and then I moved with my mom to Kentucky. Okay. So the majority of my formative years were uh, in Kentucky. Uh, and so uh, that's kind of where I identify home as okay. being Western Kentucky. And so um, I, I do uh, accents in uh, some of my videos and stuff. And that's probably because when I moved from Michigan, I had kind of what you could call a Great Lakes accent, which is very nasally. It's like, hi, my name is Tom. How are you? <laughs> you know, it's kind of like that. And so when I moved to Kentucky, um, they'd be like, Hi, what's what's your name? And I'll be like, uh, my name's Jeremy. How are you doing? Like, oh boy, you ain't from around here, are you? <laughs> like, no, I'm not. 
<laughs> so I think what it did is um, it kind of uh, mellowed the Great Lakes accent that I had and made it more not a script. And then also um, I have uh, about 50 percent hearing loss in both ears. And so oh. I always had to pay careful attention to how people spoke. And so that kind of turned into a little bit of an asset because then I could learn how to imitate people. But that yeah, is, so that's really interesting. Did you, were you eating mutton and barbecue in Kentucky at all? All right. Where I grew up in Western Kentucky, there were barbecue spots, but um, there was no mutton at all. I think that might be uh, something that's just peculiar to Owensboro, which was close to where I yeah. where I grew up. Um, we would go there, you know, relatively frequently, but we never did that. There was there was this middle of nowhere barbecue spot uh, where I grew up called Good Old Boys Pit Barbecue, and they literally had a pit in which they cooked. <laughs> all the stuff. And it was, it was uh, kind of a breakfast type barbecue place. And so people would go there at, you know, eight in the morning and these old retired guys would be eating the ribs and like direct heat, direct heat probably. Is that there? They're cooking direct. I don't even know. Oh. At, at that point I was, I was too young to even understand what was going on. True. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, didn't, I couldn't appreciate it. It was, it's one, I think barbecue is one of those things that um, for you to truly appreciate it, you have to know enough mm -hmm. to the difference between good and bad. And I think that's that's true of many things. Like true. playing music, you have to, you know, play enough to realize, oh wow, that guy's amazing. Mm -hmm. Or it could just directly over your head. Yeah, and and listen to enough and get a chance to yeah, with I guess with any and especially with cuisine when it comes to food, right. you have to have enough. Like you could probably people who don't eat a lot of sushi a lot of like even supermarket sushi, good like decent supermarket sushi is really good to them because they're not, you know, their palate hasn't been developed. Right. Right, and there's some things where I try to um, remain a simpleton, like coffee, because I have a lot of friends who are um, coffee connoisseurs, and they they can't they can't enjoy a cup of coffee from Seven Eleven, but me, I've maintained that level of ignorance so that I can get a cup of coffee there and thoroughly enjoy it. Mmm, good. <laughs> that's a great so, takeaway. That's like the best takeaway so far because <laughs> I think that's smart in life. It is if you if you become a snob, so to speak, in so many things, it's hard to enjoy just a normal meal or a normal thing like 7-Eleven coffee, which should be fine if you need it. You just right, need caffeine right. a lot of times. Right. And the, the barbecue thing is already um, uh, a little bit more difficult to appreciate because like uh, for me, so I went to Disneyland with my wife not long ago and the people we went with, um, they, the first place they went, they were like, oh, we, we came to this barbecue spot because we know you do barbecue. <laughs> and in my head, I'm thinking, oh no, this is not going to be good. <laughs> <laughs> and it was awful. But I was like, oh, thank you guys so much. This is great. I love barbecue. Mm -hmm. You know, you just have to pretend that it's great. <laughs> well, hopefully they won't watch this. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, they still meant well, and I appreciate it. No, no and, and actually, too, and it's and there is something comforting about eating smoked or cooked meat. That's that's still comforting, even though it's not probably, it probably wasn't as good as, as what you can make yourself or what you are used to having. Right. Right. So, so how did you, so the, let's, let's kind of jump forward then. Did you, how did you end up in California? Sure. So in Kentucky, I grew up, um, uh, graduated high school, went to college there. I got a degree in biochemistry, was all set to go to medical school. And then, um, I, I was just sitting in my dorm room one day and I realized that I didn't have a passion for it at all. Mm -hmm. I was like, you know, I, I could go do four years of medical school. Science has always come really easily to me. Um, it's like, I, I feel like intellectually it wouldn't be too difficult, but I, I had spent a lot of time shadowing doctors who hated their jobs. They were miserable every single day at work, and it was totally it was it was a totally different um, day to day life than I had always envisioned. Because you imagine it like it's a doctor TV show. Yeah, exactly. That's all we see. <laughs> right, and and it, it was nothing like that. And I was shadowing a lot of internal medicine doctors and. I mean, by the end of, you know, a week, I, I feel like I could have almost done the job because everybody would come in. And it's like, OK, uh, high blood pressure. We're going to give you some hydrochlorothiazide and we're going to give you some labs, check your liver, kidney, potassium, and uh, we'll give you some uh, pain medicine for your ankle or back or whatever. I mean, it's the same thing over and over uh, again. Drudgery, drudgery. Uh. Right. And so I thought, I don't want to do that. And so I decided I wasn't going to go to medical school. And um so I wanted to do what I was passionate about. And at that point, um, I had just recently become a Christian and I just wanted to study the Bible. So I moved out here actually to go to um, divinity school okay. and so study Hebrew and Greek and things like that. Which and, is fascinating uh, too. Yeah, yeah. Totally different than the biochemistry. <laughs> a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. 
but it, it was what had captured my interest at that time. And it was the thing that I was passionate about. And so to support myself, I uh, got a job uh, teaching um, AP chemistry and AP biology. I taught a lot of things, but those are the, the things that I did exclusively. I taught at a, uh, a private school in okay. Woodland Hills. And um, there were very few students. And it was kind of a, uh, I don't know how to describe it, specialized clientele, very selective. And so I was teaching those two. I taught other things, but... Those were the things that I was the exclusive teacher of. Okay. Uh, so I'm, I did a lot of stuff. I taught, you know, ninth grade English, tenth grade English, eleventh grade English, twelfth grade English. Wow. Uh, I taught, you know, math from first grade through, you know, twelfth grade. Um, I taught some Greek. I did some physics. Uh, did a <laughs> bunch of stuff. I mean, I did the reading for the entire school. I did a bunch of stuff, but those are the things that that th those were my thing, mm -hmm. you know, the thing I, I I put energy and effort into, um, and tried to get I tried to capture attention and um, get the students to 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 see all the doors that science can open for them, and so when I and it simplifies things to say AP chemistry and AP biology. Gotcha, gotcha. That's what I thought, and so I was doing that, and then uh, I had to kind of well while I was in school full time. I was teaching and I had to gradually take on more and more responsibility. I was kind of a victim of being reliable. Mm -hmm. and, um, Too reliable, yeah. Yeah, right. And so eventually it got to be to where I couldn't even take classes anymore. I was just teaching full time. I would teach my first biology class at 8 in the morning. And uh, then there was mandatory tutoring after school. So kids from other schools would come in. Wow. And, um you have to tutor them. So say kids from Sierra Canyon or Viewpoint or Harvard-Westlake. And um, it was a lot uh, – it was just demanding because the kids were paying – or the kids' parents were paying a lot of money to make sure that they succeed. And then it's my job to make them succeed. So it doesn't matter if I tried. It's – they're paying a lot of money. They expect their child to succeed. And sure. it's one, one engagement. So you have to be 100 percent there the whole time. And you can't phone it in. Wow. Because phone it in. The kids don't improve and you don't get the results that you need. And so for me as, as an introvert – I don't think I'm shy, but I'm definitely an introvert mm -hmm. – um, it was just emotionally draining. And so temperamentally, it wasn't a good fit for me because if you kind of imagine like uh, my emotional energy as uh, like a bucket full of, full of water, okay. you know, by 3 PM, that bucket was already empty with all the interactions that I'd had. And so I just had to scratch and claw and fight to make it. until oh, I was done. So you're drained at the end of the day. I'm sure you're oh, so drained. Yeah. Right. Literally, right. So yeah. I, needed a hobby. Yeah. I needed a hobby and that's where the barbecue came. Oh, cool. In. Okay. And then, so but where were you living at the time? At that time, I think I was living in North Hollywood. Okay. And you yeah. currently, where do you currently live? I live in Santa Clarita now. Oh, Santa Clarita. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And, and is that where you film your videos too in Santa Clarita? Ah, interesting story. So I get questions about this a lot because there are multiple locations. Yeah, because I'm going to jump around, but I, there's one that's like really beautiful. Okay, go on. Yeah, go on. Sure. So um, first – uh, when I was in North Hollywood, I was barbecuing every opportunity I got, um, but I wasn't filming any videos. Mm -hmm. Then I moved to Woodland Hills and I lived in an apartment there, a tiny little apartment. Um, and uh, I was still barbecuing all the time. And uh, my wife thought, hey, you know what? It'd be a good idea if you put some videos on YouTube. And I was like, well, sure. I got nothing to lose. Yeah. So for me, I'd, I'd watched a bunch of videos on YouTube and I, I always – as the kind of the scientist in me, I always wanted to know the why behind mm -hmm. everything. And it wasn't just good enough. This is what you do. I was like, well, why do you do it? Mm -hmm. And so I was like, well, maybe I'll make some videos and I'll explain some of the whys that I was asking. And so I started doing that. And, um, then we moved again and at this new apartment, we couldn't have any grill or any smoke or anything like that. Oh. And then a friend of mine said, Hey, why don't you just bring your smoker over to my place? And I was like, sure. And, um, he was an executive at Disney and I had no idea that his place was beautiful. <laughs> Right. But that was a major upgrade. So took the smoker over there and we filmed videos there. Um, and then now since I moved to Santa Clarita, when you see like the desert background, yeah. that's where I am now. Okay. And now was that – that wasn't a fat stack smoker at the beginning, right? No. So what happened was because I was I was barbecuing every opportunity I had, right? So I mean I would, I would uh, say I would get home on a weekend night um, from work. It would be – nine o'clock and I would go fire up the smoker and stay up all night to smoke some meat because it was just, it consumed everything that I was mm -hmm. doing at the time. And so 
one of the it's a benefit and a drawback, I guess, is I had lots of extra meat left over and it could have been thrown away. But I thought, well, why don't I just give it to people? Mm -hmm. And so I made friends that way. So I fed everybody in my apartment building and then was giving it to friends that I knew. And um, then I started getting requests to do events. It's like, hey, can you do my son's birthday party? We're going to have 50 people. I was like, <laughs> people, uh, maybe. And then it started getting to be, hey, can you feed 400? You can do that, right? <laughs> Are you insane? No. <laughs> wow. That's and, really crazy. That's a crazy request. <laughs> yeah. And so eventually after getting a bunch of those requests, I pulled the trigger and got the uh, fat stack smoker. And um, the first event I did was the day I picked it up. Um, it was a wedding for my friend who's an executive at Disney. Um, it was for his son's wedding. Okay. So, oh, wow. That's a lot that, of pressure, though, to do a wedding for your first event, or like first yeah, big and, event. Yeah, and uh, there were important people there, you know. I can and, imagine. Yeah, yeah. People how, I wouldn't want to mess up with. Was it a 500-gallon, or how big is that, 350? Yeah, it's a 500-gallon okay. uh, tank, um, but it's um, it's a, a Hanson tank, and the way they design it, it, it ends up being – uh, a smaller diameter, but a little bit longer. So you get, uh, in, in my opinion, a better amount of cooking space on it. The so. cook, like cause the ribs will fit better and brisket. Cause I guess, cause they're longer as opposed to white. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. So I can do maybe, I can do 25 briskets on there. Okay. I, if I go max capacity, um, comfortably I can do 20. 20 how long did it take you to, how long did it take you to get, uh, where you felt comfortable with your brisket cooks? Like I'm sure you messed up a lot and you made a lot of mistakes. I'm sure like those nights, those long nights by yourself, you, they were good, but they probably weren't good enough like to, to serve at a wedding. Oh yeah. So what I did when I was, um, when I was approaching barbecue was I treated it as if I were doing, uh, science. And so I would only ever change one thing at a time. So I might only change the temperature or only change one ingredient in the rub or only change whether or not I use a water pan. Okay. And so I kind of took all these possibilities and narrowed them down to one method uh, by which I thought I could create the best brisket possible. That's smart. That's really smart. Yeah. And so I started, I, I did that and I ruined a lot of meat at the beginning because I had no idea what I was doing. Yeah. Um, but after spending hundreds, uh, actually thousands of hours um, with that smoker, I had got it, you know, pretty, pretty dialed in. And then so when I got the big smoker and had that big cook the first day, I knew the things that I was looking for. I didn't know exactly how the smoker would respond, but I knew the things that I was looking for. So kind of the condition of the point, how the fat was rendering, whether it was getting uh, crusty there, um, how the, the flat was barking up. I, I knew those, those details that I wanted to see, mm -hmm. and I just had to toy with the smoker itself until I got it to where I wanted it. Did you sit down with Eric and Steve at Fat Stack to come up with an idea, like your spe your sp specifics? Like, because I'm sure that they have, because they can customize anything. So, what, was there yeah. was there were there specific things that you could talk about that you wanted to make sure that your smoker did or had? There were, um, but basically, the things that I focused on uh, were strictly how the smoker functioned. Um, so, the the stack diameter, the stack height. Like I remember I wanted the stack height to be taller than what was standard at the time. It's since become standard, but, um, <laughs> Isn't that funny? yeah, so I just focused on that. Um, how big the diameter from the firebox to the cook chamber would be those kinds of things where the grates were, were going to be placed, um, where the doors were going to be placed, just functionality. Mm -hmm. Um, but I didn't have any thoughts or input on the trailer itself or anything like that. And if I could go back, those are things I would have changed. But as far as the, how the cooker cooks, it, it's great. I, I don't know that I would change anything. Well, wow, that's fantastic. And, and, and with mad scientists, how did you, the, the name, obviously you're, you're really super into science. So is that mad scientists? Right. how do you come up with the, the YouTube channel? Um, how do you come up with the name or well, the name, the name itself? Yeah. Is that just, were you known as a mad scientist? Is that something that people have called you before or did you just think that would, no, I don't think anybody called me mad scientist. Before. <laughs> do you um, call yourself one? Do you think of yourself as a mad scientist? Not, not really. Um, I just, I think, I think it was essentially what name could I come up with where I get across the idea that I want to take science and barbecue and mm. put them together. So, you could you could know no science at all and produce tremendous barbecue. But I think what science gives you is a lens through which you can view the process and understand more about how it works. 
I agree. And so that's what I wanted to communicate in the name. And I thought, okay, Mad Scientist Barbecue, because I could have done Scientist Barbecue, but it didn't have the same ring to my ear, at least. As yeah. Well. And I don't know if people would be as interested. I think it it it, it, pe- it piques some interest. Like it's it's something that I want to know what this guy is saying because it just it sounds. I'm curious. And then if they're not into barbecue or science, then they probably they might not be interested in anything. <laughs> sure, sure. So then, so how did how how did the progression go to where you started to get traction? Were you getting a lot of feedback from viewers? Were people subscribing more? Like how did you know that this was actually hit, touching a nerve? Um, I don't know. I got. Uh... There were a few videos that I did that seemed to get a lot of traction, and uh, one of them was how to manage your smoker fire. And basically, in that video, I describe what it means to have clean smoke, a little bit of the scientific basis. I wasn't going to go super in depth yeah. because it's it's more than most people need. I mean, they don't have to understand that you know the wood is undergoing a process called pyrolysis and it's those exhaust gases that are actually catching fire and turning into those flames that you see whereas the coal is primary was primary combustion etc they don't need to know all that stuff True. yes right? but um I, I gave a little bit of kind of science background to what you're looking for to produce clean smoke and why it's better and i thought here here's a video that i think can kind of give people a, a window into how I view barbecue. And it's something that I think could help a lot of people because sure. I've had a lot of dirty smoke barbecue that other people have made. And I always try to be polite and everything, but I think if they just cleaned up their smoke, that would solve most of the barbecue problems. For that sure. And that one started to get a lot of traction. Were you getting a lot of people writing back or sharing it? Um, I had a lot of people commenting on that. And most of the comments were something along the lines of, hey, when I started watching this video, I thought this video is too long. But you kept my interest. <laughs> and then the uh, alternate version of that was, hey, when I started watching this video, I thought this kid doesn't know anything. But after watching it, I think you know what you're talking about. <laughs> that's great. And that's nice that you're coming from – because somebody could call himself a mad scientist and like not really – just do it as like a moniker. Like I just have that as a name. But you actually – you care about the science behind what you're doing. So that's – I think that's an awesome concept. And I, and I think – and for some reason this reminds me a little bit of like Alton Brown, how, how there was all these cooking shows out. But he he was delving into the why as well. Yeah, I think so too. Um, to me, there's a – Little kids will always ask why. Mm -hmm. That's something kids will ask why. Well, how come the sun doesn't burn up the earth, right? They'll they'll ask why Mm -hmm. things that that adults will just accept and just move on with their Mm -hmm. lives, right? And I think when you completely lose that, you lose a lot of the the vibrancy in whatever thing you're doing. And I think that uh, approaching barbecue through science or cooking in general through science opens up a lot of those whys and can make it interesting again and can kind of open up new avenues um, that you can go down in terms of just trying out new things with food. Now, one thing that I don't want to do is I don't want to try to to make people think that traditional methods of barbecue are in any way wrong or bad Mm -hmm. because I I think when people kind of get on the the train of, oh, everything has to be molecular gastronomy, right, where they're doing liquid nitrogen stuff and – to me, those are kind of gimmicks. Mm-hmm. Right? But if you really think about it, even these you know old school barbecue cooks, they're doing molecular gastronomy. They For just sure. don't do it, right? So there, there's Maillard reaction happening on the exterior. The meat that they're cooking, they're producing those compounds that are going to absorb into the meat, creating a complex with myoglobin so you get a smoke ring. They're doing all this stuff mm-hmm. that could call molecular gastronomy it just doesn't get the credit that it deserves so do you think that do you foresee yourself eventually teaching classes in barbecue or writing a book like what's what's the what's then the future for your channel as well as for you um yeah that's something i've thought about um i've gotten offers to do restaurants and stuff people want to invest um and i thought about it and then i thought i don't want to get myself into the position where i'm stuck in the day-to-day operation of a restaurant yeah. because it feels like quagmire and then there are a million additional headaches i got to pay my staff i got to pay the overhead you know for the, the the building that i'm in all of those things but for me the interest is in pursuing how to make great food and 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 what sets barbecue apart and and how to maximize those good characteristics of barbecue that give everybody just an immediate response of you know they take a bite of great barbecue and it's like wow this yeah. is amazing it's an epiphany yeah for sure right. And so I, I wanted to do that 
um, in whatever you know medium I could. I, I don't want to be caught in like trying to make a restaurant work. Mm-hmm. And so whatever avenues I have to try to popularize barbecue, to educate people about barbecue, um, and just promote barbecue in general, whether it's working with um, people who make barbecue smokers, the people who are you know, doing OG barbecue like the people I'm going to see in Texas, mm-hmm. or just everyday average backyard barbecuers, if, if I can help them develop an appreciation for great barbecue and maybe give them some tools that they can use to improve the quality of what they're making, I think everybody is served by that. So in, so in a sense, you're, just, you're going to grow your channel, continue to grow and offer more information for people, right? Isn't that kind of... Do you not, you're yeah. not, you're not going to, you're not opening a restaurant or partnering with somebody or you, but do you think you'll ever teach classes? Is that something I think, I just feel like I've learned a lot already. I think that you would, <laughs> I think you're, and you've done the teaching round. I, maybe you don't want to be, you're teaching in a sense online and it's, it's different than. Yeah. So I've thought about doing classes. Um, I've had a lot of requests where people will message me all the time. Hey, can I come hang out while you're doing one of your cooks? And you know, I get that pretty yeah, frequently. Yeah. Um, and I thought about teaching classes and I looked up what some people do for classes and um, they charge what seems to me exorbitant prices I know. to do to do not a whole heck of a lot. And, and it appeared at least from what I found, this might not be true for everybody, I'm not trying to paint with too broad a brush here, but it appeared that it was simply they would say, this is how I trim, this is how I season, and now we get to eat the final product. But you don't go through the process of the cook mm-hmm. so much. And to me, that – that cooking process is the secret. That's right? everything, so, yeah. You know, Aaron Franklin's secret is, I don't think there is a secret. I think it's just incredible attention to detail mm-hmm. where, he, where he, he was basically micromanaging every aspect until he got the, the, the process down pat. Yeah, And exactly. so I think it's, it's doing that process, but you have to do it several times. And so you have to know a few key things to look for. It's like, um, what does it mean to be rendering the fat, right? So you have to know what you're looking for when you see that. Um, like what is the feel that you want, you know? Um, and it, that just takes experience. And I don't think you could really offer that in a, in one class. I think you could get people in the right direction, but until they've done it enough to really be trained, I don't think you could say, "Well, now you're a barbecue expert." Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, I th- so I think I think this is the the best medium. It's such a great medium. Now, for for your travels, are you traveling when you go, when you're going to Austin right now or shortly? Will you be going with your wife and some other people, or are you just going and are you filming? What kind of equipment are you using too? Okay, sure. So, <laughs> we have a Canon ADD. I don't know if that's good or bad. It's just one that I found online. It was uh-huh. a video creator kit or something. So I was like. Uh, <laughs> One click buy, thanks Amazon. <laughs> um, that's that's what we use. Um, but it'll be me, my wife. Um, I invited Eric from Fat Stack Smokers. Oh, cool. Yeah, so he's going to be coming. Uh, he's never been. And then um, Alec Lopez. He's the pit master at, at Pearl's Barbecue in Los Angeles. Okay, yeah, yeah. And I've kind of been working with him, mentoring him, um, trying to help him. Figure... You did some cooks over at Pearl's earlier, early on, didn't you? Yeah, I, I did that. Um, it was just. To help out, yeah, to help out, just, yeah. I'm trying to make money or anything. Um, I was like, they need somebody. Yeah, I'll do it. Yeah, because they were always nice to me, and yeah, they have a fat stack smoker, and you're familiar with that. Yeah, yeah. And so, Alec Lopez from Pearls is going to be coming as well, and um, uh, we're going to be hitting all those spots. And so, uh, we're That's going to be fun. filming, I think, one video at each of those locations because we're going to. I think Snows is number one. Um, we're going to go check out the smoke room at Franklin's. That's number two. Um, Mickleweight is in the top 10 somewhere. It's in the top 10. Yeah. Uh, and Louis Mueller is also in the top 10. Like top five. I think that, yeah. 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 They're, they're you know, well, they're, 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 yeah. And that's, those are all great locations. And right. And so what I want to do, uh, I, w- I want Alec to go basically because he's going to maybe by seeing what they do there. But I think more than anything, he'll be inspired mm-hmm. because he'll, he'll, this, this happened to me. This happens to a lot of people. You go and you eat it and you're like, Oh my goodness, this is incredible. I got to learn how to do this. Mm-hmm. So I think just kind of lighting a fire under him just to, you know, keep at it and master the process and just so invest- going to be almost following his, his epiphanies almost like, are you, are, is he going to be filmed as well? Is he going to be, are you all you think, or is, I know you will, you'll be on camera for sure. Yeah. Um, you know, actually, I haven't even talked to him about it. But I kinda, it would be kind of interesting, at least, to see his. I think at least you should film his first bite 
of yeah. something, yeah. or at least of like the be- getting the beef rib at Louis Miller. I think that's something that you should film that for sure. At least, <laughs> and, and if you haven't had it, then at least make sure you're on film for your first bite of, that, of those things. And like the, the sausage at Louis Miller, like, yeah, that's, that's going to be fantastic. And, 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 uh, Mickle, Mickle Thwait, Mickle Thwait. <laughs> I think I even know how to pronounce it and it doesn't come out even right. But right. I think, yeah, those like he, his sides are so re- remarkable too. Like it, oh, his barbecue is amazing, but his sides, he is a, yeah. yeah. A lot of times barbecue, the sides can just be an afterthought mm-hmm. because the meat is the star. Um, but yeah, I have to check that out. That's changing. Sure. Yeah. It's changing now in Texas and around the United States. I found that people are expecting a little bit more from the sides. And I think it's, it's also too, if you bring along someone that's not a, a carnivore, it's kind of nice for them to have a little side meal that they could have like three or four sides. Sure. That's a good point. Yeah. And one one thing I noticed about that list on the Texas Barbecue Top Ten was that most of the top ten restaurants on their list are relatively new. There are a few that are mm-hmm. that have been around forever, like Louis Mueller has been around forever. Mm-hmm. But most of them, I, if I remember correctly, they've all opened within the last I don't know ten fifteen years. Oh yeah, yeah. Some some within the last like four to five years. Like there's. Yeah, there's Corkscrew, there's Tejas. These are places like near Houston that weren't weren't around. Cadillac in Dallas, those weren't right. around say eight years ago, nine years ago for sure. Yeah, so I think it's remarkable. That's- I think that that barbecue's taking off, and I think one of the places it can really take off is a place like Los Angeles. Yes. Now, if they just get introduced to, mm-hmm. you know, great barbecue. When I do barbecue pop ups. Sometimes people come and talk to me for you know an hour afterwards because they'll say, I've never had anything like that. that. That was amazing. How do you do it? What what do I need to get to be able to make this? Can we start a religion around your brisket? You know, um, <laughs> it's just because they don't know. Whereas in Texas, you know, they could say, Oh, that was good or that was great or mm-hmm. that was okay or not so great. But they know they they have they have kind of the um the, they have the palate to discern mm-hmm. those things. Yeah, right? if you've grown up eating it. And going and, and understanding how the line works, how the food works, how you're supposed to eat it, what you're supposed to eat it with white bread, all these things that you know, for us in Los Angeles, it makes that makes no sense. Right, right, exactly. Yeah, the white bread. <laughs> so and when I do my pop ups, we always have white bread, right, and we serve it with uh, we have pickles and we have onions, oh. and people will occasionally look at the white bread and be like, what? This is weird. It's you have this like artisanal meat product, uh-huh. and then industrial white bread they feel like honestly i honestly feel like people think you're being cheap about it which they don't realize (laughs) it's being traditional as opposed to it's it's a thing white bread pickles onions Mm -hmm. what you serve barbecue with yeah have you um so do you do pop-ups then is that something that people can look can follow you and you do pops pop-ups every or is it a group pop-up how does that work for you oh so i do um usually one pop-up per month uh and i mean i could do more um, but it just works best for me to do one pop-up per month and I do catering and private events. Um, and so where I usually pop up is a place called Pocock Brewing in, I believe it's Valencia. Okay. Uh, it's in Santa Clarita Valley. Oh, that's and, good to know. Um, yeah. So, I mean, it works out well because there are people who show up for the barbecue who then go inside and drink beer. No, it's perfect. It's perfect. To drink beer who then come out and eat the barbecue. Exactly. So it's good. The, the, the people there, the owners there are great. I can't say enough good things about them. They've been awesome. Um, and, uh, yeah, so I, basically I do that so I can introduce the public to that's great. Bar- legit well, cool. barbecue, you know, cook with a real wood fire. I think that, you know, you can go to barbecue spots in LA and even some decent barbecue spots, but they have propane assist smokers and mm-hmm. things like that. But I think that what makes barbecue special now you have to keep in mind that barbecue is like the one unique American cooking style. You know, if if you go to culinary school, you could be trained like, you know, a French chef or mm-hmm. maybe you could be trained as an Italian chef or Thai or any number of different places. But barbecue is something that's uniquely American and special. And I think we, we should embrace it and promote oh, yeah. it. Um, and uh, well, that's what you're you're introducing people at the pop ups to this to to this American, this traditionally American cuisine. Right. right. Yeah. So I want to introduce people to that and, and promote it. And I, I always encourage people that they can do it themselves. You know, they, they say, when are you going to be back? And I, I'll tell them when I'll be back. But then, uh, you know, you can do this too. Mm-hmm. You can get a smoke. You don't have to spend a fortune, but you can get out there and you're going to have a ton of fun doing it. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I do that to just basically promote barbecue. And, um, you know, for the people who want to come eat the barbecue, they can. It's a fairly regular thing. 
Well, that's great. No, that's great to know. And I'll, I'll put, I'll put links to all your social media and to everything. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll try to come out to the next pop-up that you have, because I'd like to personally, yeah. personally meet you and I'll, I'll film a little bit there as well. But also sure. I, it's, I think that's interesting because I'll, I think that spreading the, spreading the, um, the love that way for people, because they can, most of the people that I've talked to that haven't been born into a barbecue family buy a little crappy, not totally crap, but a small, like a, a a smoker that you get at Home Depot or at Osh or wherever, and they learn on their on their balcony, or they learn, and then they graduate up to like a 125, like to something bigger. But I think that people end up. Uh, you can learn on anything. You can learn on like I learned on a Weber Bullet. That's kind of how I first learned how to smoke. Sure. Yeah, that's an interesting issue. So people, one of the requests I get most frequently is people want to know what kind of smoker should I get, and part of me wants to say, hey, you can get a really cheap smoker and then you kind of refine your process and figure out what you're doing and then you can graduate to something better. But I'm reluctant to say that. Uh, because I know there are a lot of people who've done that, but there are probably an equal number of people who started with something like that. And after getting frustrated by ruining so That's much true. heat, they just quit. That's true. Right. So first we have to get over the hurdle of people confusing barbecue with grilling. Right. <laughs> and then once we get past that, yes, then we can kind of get to the place where they can um, appreciate, you know, barbecue for, for what it is. And the only way they can really, well, not the only way, but one of the best ways they can do that is to do it themselves. Yes. And so if they start with kind of subpar uh, equipment, it's going to be really difficult to produce great barbecue. And so what I usually encourage people to do is get a decent offset smoker with the caveat that you're going to have to spend a lot of time tending that fire. Mm -hmm. and you're going to have to get used to it. And it's going to be uh, uh, an involved process and it's not going to be easy. You're going to have to watch it like a hawk, all those things. Or I say, get something like a, a pellet smoker is one choice or uh, something like a Weber smoky mountain mm -hmm. or you can kind of adjust events and it'll run. True, true. But I, I just, I hate seeing people get frustrated with kind of cheap offset smokers ruining meat. Yes. And I don't want to have barbecue ruined for anybody that way. Yeah, yeah, and you want so you want people to continue doing it, and and it does take a certain type of person if they have something that they ruin five times in a row. Chances are they probably will quit. Right, and then for a lot of guys, it's an it's an ego thing too if they've ruined a lot of stuff, you know, over and over again. Because you know, barbecue is like uh, driving and sex. All men think that they're good at it. So if they you know ruin something. And then they try it again and they ruin it and they try it again and they ruin it. They think, oh, well, this, this whole process is garbage. Mm -hmm. I, it's not user error. And if, they, yeah. and if they've invited a bunch of friends over and they've been cooking for 12 hours and then it's, right. it's real, terrible. Yeah, a real defeat. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. You feel like you invested so much into it and then True. almost embarrassed to serve the, the product at the end. It's just it, – it's a crushing defeat for your ego. That is true. Well, well, Jeremy, thank you so much for taking the time, and I, I think you've shed insight into what you're doing and to, to your path. And I think it's a it's an interesting one. And are there any is there anything that we missed about you or that you'd want to talk about that that people should know about you? Yeah. So I guess, well, I guess one thing we we didn't really talk about is so I taught until the end of last year, and then I was going back to school full time until the until December, um, to finish up my master's in divinity. And it's only been since January 1st that I've been kind of free to do barbecue, um, and barbecue videos as, as you know, my main thing. Mm. And, uh, one of the things that I'm really excited about doing is coming up, I, I ordered a bunch of scientific equipment and I want to basically quantify as much about the barbecue process as I can. Oh. So I want to measure air speeds. I want to measure fire temperatures. I want to measure the rate at which the, um, the exhaust removes smoke from the cook chamber, how rapidly the air cycles through the cook chamber and what effect that has. Uh, lots of um, experiments with uh, smoke absorption and uh, a lot of different kinds of briskets. I want to do as much as I can to get as much information out there as possible. Now that I have the time to do that, I can invest that time into – hopefully improving everybody's barbecue experience. So that that's what will be saying. awesome. That's going to be really, really cool. So when will those, when do you think some of those videos will start ro rolling out? Um, I think, yeah, within a month. Uh, so I had this um, Austin visit. We're going to just hammer filming. It's going to be barbecue from, from uh, dawn till dusk basically. Yeah. And um, after that, I think the following weekend i'll probably be starting to film some of those things i'm also going to be working with uh eric from fat stack smokers so we're going to come up with ideas that we want to test and then he's going to be able to fabricate something 
on the fly because you can just do that. And we see what effect that has. And so That's I think really cool. it's awesome for, for him, for his business, because it'll give him exposure and he makes great stuff. Such great uh, stuff, yeah. Yeah, and it's going to help me out because I can't weld all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, it's going to help the uh, barbecue consumer by giving them more helpful information. For, for so, sure. Yeah, yeah, and that's funny. It's the, when I talked to Eric, uh, when I met him over at uh, Burt's one time, we were yeah. uh, we were talking about just in general. He was talking about welding and how he because he teaches welding and how yeah. he he thought that that like if you're if you graduate from high school and you don't quite know what kind of career you want to go to, he I've I've quoted him many times. People telling people you should go into welding. Welding is actually a really good career. I just never it never crossed my mind to be a welder. Right. So this isn't barbecue related, but my experience as a teacher has kind of taught me that I don't think that college is necessarily for everybody, even though it's kind of pounded in your head that I if agree. you don't go to college, you're a failure and you're a horrible person or, you know, you know, at least a lot of parents will, will yeah. kind of get into their kids. But I think that it's equally valid for kids to go to trade schools and find some kind of um, profession where they can apprentice mm -hmm. and become a master at whatever they're doing. I think yeah. it's equally valid. Yeah, well, that's good. And that's great. And that's what that that's it's essentially what Eric was saying is that's so great. Well, this is this is really cool. I'm glad I got to officially meet you. And cool. I'm, I'm really excited to, to follow your journey. And I'll spread the word about what you're doing. I think it's awesome. Excellent. Well, have, yeah, have a great week. And thank you again so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Take, right, care. take, take care. Bye.